As we survey the area of world religions, we observe that from the earliest time, cults of healing were associated with the workings of the temples and the shrines and the sanctuaries. Man at a very early date turned to his deities not only for the preservation of the world around him, but for the protection and support of his own inner life. And in the early days there was a common belief that for a long time we more or less rejected, especially with the rise of science, that in some way sickness uh, was a punishment for offending the gods. Today we are beginning to take the attitude that a good deal of sickness is a result of breaking natural laws. To the ancient, the term natural law inferred divine law. And as he recognized no essential difference between spiritual and material things, he assumed in his own way that whatever nature punished, it indicated that God was outraged in some way. Today we take a far less theological point of view, but we are beginning to suspect that there are rules in the game of living and that there are penalties of various kinds for breaking these rules. We also have come by degrees to take the position that the breaking of certain rules is almost inevitable. Inevitable because in our way of life we are surrounded by rule breakers. These are found in every level of our society. And when the rule breakers become a dominant factor in our psychology of life, we must all, to a measure, uh, pay for these mistakes. Thus, in our pattern of things, industrial, scientific, political, social, economic, the patterns that now exist have very little relationship to common sense. We are not living according to an ideal sociological pattern. We are living very largely for the immediate fulfillment of desires and ambitions. We are captured within a network of economic pressures for which the average person has no answer. He can only live as best he can in a situation that often outrages his own integrity. As this has always, to a measure, likewise had uh, diffusion through our society, we realize that as far back as 2,500 years, when Gautama Buddha began his ministry in India, that the people of that country also lived according to certain pressures and expediencies. Buddhism itself was a rise up of public opinion against the pressures of Hinduism and Brahmanism. The world was disillusioned in the patterns of administration which controlled and often enslaved uh, the average person. So Buddhism had to face in its day the same general conditions that exist in our time. The pressures probably were not so great, but on the other hand, the individual had not developed the immunities to pressure which more uh, protected him against some of the situations uh, which we have faced down through time. In any event, all around the world were the shrines of the healing gods. In the early ministry of Christianity, healing was one of the essential concepts of the doctrine itself. One of the 
dedications of the apostles was that they should go forth and preach the doctrine, but also they were admonished to heal the sick. This undoubtedly implied in that time that these peoples regarded sickness as arising from certain benightedness, from certain false beliefs within the person, so that by teaching, uh, by guiding the life of the individual into a more constructive channel, by increasing man's faith in principles and his dedication to the service of principles, improvements could be wrought in the area of health. In the Buddhist world, uh, a deity appeared or was brought into being out of the popular need of mankind that is now uh, known as the Yakuchi Buddha. This deity is in the same imagery as Gautama, seated, cross-legged, with one hand raised in the, in the posture of admonishing or teaching, the other hand resting in the lap, holding a small jar of ointment. The healing Buddha is always marked with this jar of ointment, this symbol of universal medicine. First of all, the general concept implies the conviction that the doctrine itself was a kind of medicine a medicine against the ignorance, the pressure, the tension, the stress, the unhappiness, the insecurity, all the forces which combining together create what we call today the sickness syndrome. In other words, the individual is sick because of many different pressures operating upon his own life. We like to think centuries ago, that sickness was a completely physical situation, that if the individual lived in an unhealthful environment, if he uh, had no knowledge of sanitation, if he failed in the common care and preservation of his food, that these types of problems could be the cause of epidemical disease, and no doubt they were. Gradually, however, we have overcome, for the most part, these purely physical causes of sickness. We have greater knowledge of health procedure than ever before in history. We have corrected most of the situations which make epidemical disease likely, although we are still chasing the mysterious and elusive elements behind the common cold. For the most part, however, we have become informed in the simple rules of health. And while we often still break these rules, we know that they exist, and even the comparatively young person is aware of their importance. <clears throat> Yet in spite of this tremendous advance in general knowledge, we are not a healthy people. Not only are we continuously afflicted with new and mysterious ailments, but we also have developed a whole overtone of psychic sickness, which breaking through into our physical lives gives us a new source of trouble. We have overcome many of the problems of nature around us. We are now face to face with the greater problems of human nature within us. And until these greater problems are solved, we cannot look forward with optimism to a more healthy world. Now there are several different factors contributing, for example, to the present situation. One of these problems and factors is undoubtedly our ethical structure. Our ethical structure must dominate the relationships of people and must particularly apply to the relationship of physician and patient as we find less and less true rapport between the doctor and the sick, we are, of course, in the presence of a new cause of physical ailment. 
a cause arising from misunderstanding, misinterpretation of phenomena, misapplications of principles, and a generally lowering platform of ethical relationships. Uh, not uh, so long ago, we uh, were faced with medical strikes in some countries. We have one in Belgium at the present time in which the physician, in order to maintain his fees, is perfectly willing to permit the sick to die. This situation, of course, is something that we must all think through very carefully because unless we solve these ethical overtones, we are not going to defeat illness. We are not going to maintain health on the highest possible attained level. We also have today a very heavy and serious economic factor involved in the healing of the sick. This economic factor prevents a large percentage of our population from having adequate medical care and has built up a serious psychological barrier uh, between uh, the sick person and the medical institutions upon which he must depend. Here we have exa an example, for, for instance, of the concept behind the Yakshi Buddha. This uh, concept of healing dedicates the physician to the principles of his religion. It uh, dedicates him even more completely even than the Hippocratic Oath of uh, ancient times. It insists that health, for example, could be far more diffused, uh, conditions in general would be greatly improved if the physician basically regarded himself as a kind of priest, as one set aside from the common uh, business of his time to the primary end of serving those who are in need. That this end and this service shall be the first consideration. Now there are doctors today who hold this attitude and hold it very sincerely and with great dedication of spirit. But there are others who do not. And wherever this relationship of the sacredness of the healing arts and the peculiar sacred responsibility of the physician, where these are ignored as factors or allowed to diminish or gradually vanish in the pressure of an economic relationship, then something has happened that is injurious to the common health of mankind. So the very beginning, I think, of our problem from the standpoint of Buddhist medicine is this realization that man was primarily born for one purpose as far as his relations with other people are concerned. Mm -hmm. And this purpose is exemplified in one of the three great basic statements of Buddhism, mm -hmm. namely that the individual is here to serve others that he is here for the primary purpose of making life better for all living things, that he has a basic responsibility, and that this responsibility is far more important than personal advantage. Therefore, if the internal life of the physician is dedicated, uh, then the advancement of medicine is far more rapid in any area where this physician may practice. In Buddhism, I think it is also interesting to re recognize that three levels of personal activity within the individual are clearly marked and delineated. They are called bodies, or uh, represent perhaps uh, three interrelating kinds of personality within the individual himself. The first and lowest of these bodies is termed the physical body. And uh, in the Buddhist system of philosophy, this body represents more or less the historical body of the person. Uh, in this body, Gautama himself was born, grew up, ministered, grew old, and finally uh, passed into the Paranirvana. He passed out of existence around his 80th year 
went to sleep beside the Indian road where he had preached for 45 years. <clears throat> now we know that in this period of his life, certain changes had to take place within him. He had to be a child. He had to grow up. He had to be a young man and a man of mature years. And later as he wandered the roads of Bengal, he had to become an old man, wrinkled of body, and probably a little infirm within his own physical integration. These changes he neither denied in his philosophy or provided any solution for. But in art, particularly, he is never so represented as changing and aging. From the time of the illumination to the time of his Taranavana, he is represented as always the same, as of a kind of maturity, untouched by decrepitude of any kind. And usually in art, he is represented uh, haloed, surrounded by light, and uh, perhaps robed in a mysterious garment of gold and color, embellished by the artist, not that he ever was such a garment himself. And in Oriental art he is often, almost usually, represented in painting with his body gilded. This is because to these people uh, there was within and behind the physical personality a second which they called the Samboda body. This was the body of enlightenment. This is the way that the teacher looked inside. If you went past the surface of him into his inner life, you saw this radiant being, the symbol of his own illumined achievement. And uh, to the Buddhist peoples everywhere, it was customary to represent the teacher in art in this Samboda body as a great luminous being. Not because they, they physically ever saw him that way, they knew better than that. But they liked to realize that within him was something that, as one of the old works tell us, shone through him, that a great light seemed to come out of him, a light of kindness, a light of thoughtfulness, of wisdom, and of gentleness. <laughs> And somewhere behind this mere form of an ordinary man mingling with other men along the road, there was something that separated him from other men. And this was the luminousness of his own soul. So the Samboda vehicle, which is represented usually in art, shows this invisible, luminous person. This person whose light radiated from his own body to become part of the very teachment that he gave the world, for he taught by the example of light radiant through him into the world. To these people, therefore, this other transcendent body had com command or dominion over the ordinary vehicle of flesh. We know this in a funny way, in a kind of abstract sense today, we have always realized and recognized that within certain people there was more of this radiance than in certain other people. We look up at the rather angular, unhandsome features of the great statue of Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. We see this tall, gaunt man with a wrinkled face and yet we do not think of him this way. As far as our people are concerned, our Lincoln is this Samboda body, this body of great kindness, this radiance that shines through the angular structure of flesh, this something that has raised Lincoln not as a physical body, but as a person in a body to the love, admiration, and respect of all the generations that have followed him. Thus we find everywhere where persons develop great inward strength, great values within themselves, we sense this radiance coming through them. We sense this radiance for the moment in the natural affection of parent and child. There are moments when something comes out that is not just of the flesh, but makes the flesh something very beautiful and wonderful 
as the small child may look adoringly at a parent who is not physically attractive, but to whom this child has given tremendous overtones of affection and regard. So the recognition of the Samboda body demands two things. First, that there be a great achievement of some kind within the person. And in the second place, that that person must so conduct themselves that others become aware of value beneath the surface of appearance. The same uh, is true in the legends we have of Socrates, who certainly was not a handsome man. But when one of his disciples was asked how he could be a disciple of so ugly and deformed a person, looked in astonishment at the questioner and said, as far as he knew, Socrates was the most handsome man in Athens. Handsome because of the power that was within him for good. In Buddhism, therefore, the, the growth of principles within the individual, uh, this growth results in a luminous internal, a radiance of good. This radiance extending through the person into the world is possibly the mysterious little jar of ointment that the Yakshi Buddha carries in his hand. This is the power that is for the healing of the nations. This is the power of good which is the universal medicine. And it is this power of good which touching progress makes progress good. It is this power of good that touching the medical arts makes the physician great and makes the labor of the scientist in medicine important and real. There can be no truly enlightened progress unless this enlightenment arises within the overtones of human nature. Even institutions are said to possess these Samboda bodies. The dedicated institution becomes a radiant symbol of principles. The dedicated organization, even in industry or economics, wherever there is behind an idea, wherever there is behind a policy, a great radiant light, a light of truth-seeking, a light of reality attaining, a light of dedication, of responsibility and value. This light shines through and becomes a mysterious power of alchemical transmutation, changing all things to the likeness of itself, touching others, touching the world, touching even the universe with a tremendous importance uh, the, of its own value. Then in Buddhism there is again a third body, which is called the Dhammakaya, or the body of the law. Uh, they, uh, the Buddhist has no adequate way to represent this any more than the artistry of any other nation has been able to. This mysterious Dhamma body is something that is so remote, so elusive, that we cannot really comprehend it. But it simply means the body of the law itself. It means the eternity that is in the core of everything, the universality, the inevitability, the infinite, which is captured somewhere in the root of all finiteness. In uh, the Eastern countries, there was only one way that the people uh, could achieve some artistic representation of this, and that was through the creation of the colossal image. Uh, here they used the idea of size uh, to convey something uh, that they had no other way of representing. In Japan there are two enormous figures, one of Amida and one of Virakana. The one of Amida at Kamakura is probably the most beautiful image in the world. It is over 40 feet in height, and the uh, image of the Virakana at Nara is nearly 50 feet in height. These two great bronze castings uh, are an effort to capture the idea of the body of the law. Why and how? Very simply. No one can come into the presence of these images without being in some way emotionally impressed by magnitude. In the presence of these images, the individual 
experiences a kind of awe. He experiences something in which he becomes aware, at least for instance, for an instant, of an overwhelmingness. And this was the only way they had of trying to imply this overwhelming quality of consciousness that comes to the individual when he suddenly realizes that the universe itself is the vast image. That in the universe itself there is something that we can reach out to, but in the presence of which we must bow. The universe is so infinite, so tremendous, not only in size but in qualities. It is so infinitely wise, so infinitely good, so infinitely lawful, that in the presence of it we sense this overwhelmingness. The only answer to it is that we do instinctively bow our heads in reverence. Another example of the Dharma body used in ancient symbolism throughout the world was the mountain, the great pure peak with its glacial crest, its, sl its slopes white with eternal snow, rising to a vast height above the valley. In the presence of the mountain, we also had a concrete symbol of the immensity of something. And therefore, from the beginning of our religious experience, we have lifted up our eyes unto the hills from whence cometh our help. This sense of standing in the presence of majesty, not the majesty of man, but the infinite majesty of principles, <coughs> this is the nearest that, uh, that ancient peoples could come to a symbol to recognize or represent the infinite life of things. And the, in the presence of this principle of the law, this infinite, this inevitable, this immutable, all must bow. Bow to truth, bow to reality, bow to virtue, bow to the infinite in infinite manifestation. And this, in a sense, was the ground, the very essence and substance of the great ethics. For ethics consisted in the recognition of these eternal principles and the dedication to obey them. The, the true dedication uh, to serve all that lives in the name of this infinite all life, which we can sense to a degree, but never fully experience. In the practice of medicine, therefore, uh, the Buddhist concept was that the physician had to have, in addition to his physical body with its transformations, he had to have behind it the Samboda body, the body of the healer. That his success in every area depended upon this radiant life moving through him. If he did not have this radiance within himself, he could be skillful, but he could not be great. If he did not have this radiance within himself, he could not make the ultimate contribution uh, to the service of his profession. He could not some way be all that a physician can be. To the degree that he had these convictions and principles, he became a better doctor. And as a result of being a better doctor, he was able to bring peace and consolation and insight and health to more people. If he was only a well-trained intellectual, and in his own life within himself, instead of this luminous body, there were all the personal ambitions of the undedicated individual. If uh, the most important thing to him was the status of his profession, if he was dedicated to secondary causes instead of primary causes, if he was perfectly willing to neglect his patients in order to go on some weekend jaunt of his own, if he did not accept the full magnitude of his profession, if he had not within himself this dedicated enlightenment, if he did not feel within his own nature that through him a kind of universal healing agent was being disseminated to mankind, if he did not accept his ordination as a priest in the temple of healing, then this Samboda body within him did not shine. He was working merely from surfaces. 
He was working in medicine as though he were a real estate agent or a second-hand car dealer. There was no essential difference. Both of these other men also had the opportunity to develop inner light. Whatever we do can be luminous and great if it is dedicated to some common need. The most simple labors of life, in public or in private, can also create the Samboda luminosity. But only if we go under the surface of the everyday and begin to add to the common practices that we have this luminous sympathy for mankind, this internal dedication to some good that we honestly and sincerely believe that we are accomplishing. And this Samboda body disintegrates very rapidly under the pressure of great personal selfishness or ambition. There can be no great dedication to others if our final dedication is to our own ego. So in the uh, development of this Buddhist symbol of the perfect physician, we have the physician who cures by his very presence, who brings help simply because he is there, and because the luminous quality which he radiates touches the need, the fear, the hunger, the doubt of the sick. And because it is there, there is a new faith, there is a new confidence, there is a new idealistic relationship between the physician and the patient. Now we will say that in our Western way of life this is very difficult to attain because of the brief period we can allot to the sick. The average physician has a heavy practice. He has heavy expenses and heavy responsibilities. These things we take for granted. Yet actually this is not the heart of the issue. It isn't the time, it isn't all the detailed contact that is the most essential thing. In Buddhism it is the alchemical transference of the tremendous integrity that underlies the relationship. Perhaps the doctor can only give ten minutes to the patient. But if with that ten minutes he gives something of this radiance of himself, if he communicates even in that brief instant something of the healing power of great consciousness behind him, he may still achieve far more than he can do in the ordinary prescribing of remedies for the various ailments that come for consideration. In the Samboda principle, therefore, we have the beginning of the great healing therapy, the great healing concept in Buddhist philosophy. Now we carry it to another step, however, uh, in, the, in the old Eastern doctrine. The individual, finally, in all philosophy and religion, must become the healer of himself. It is certain that we would have to have help if we broke an arm or broke a leg. It would not, not be easy for us to handle some problems involving health. But more and more, we have to realize that this principle of the physician is part of our own Samboda constitution. In other words, in mysticism, in Buddhist philosophy, every human being has an indwelling physician. Having has a power within himself by means of which it is possible for him to radiate through his own consciousness something of the power that he needs to maintain the order and uh, harmony of his own body. This Samboda consciousness within the individual, however, is not at any time directly a relationship based upon health, as we understand the term at least. In other words, uh, Buddhism would never encourage a devout person uh, to settle down to try to be good or try to be wise simply in order that they might achieve health or preserve it. In other words, this philosophy is not one of calisthenics or gymnastics, essentially. The concept behind this power is always that the individual, by bringing about the final integration of his own life, achieves a number of byproducts in the process of so doing. 
Once the consciousness is established within the individual, he can call forth out of the imagery of his own nature the various aspects of this consciousness as they are required for certain procedures or certain needs of life. Once the person has this luminous inward self, this luminosity manifests in whatever form is needed under the existing condition. For this luminosity is, uh, we might say, a universal medicine against not only the ills of the flesh, but the ills of society, of law and of policy, the ills of crime and of war, the ills that come from any situation in which the evils multiply due to lack of insight. So the essential purpose in the Buddhist discipline is the creation within the individual of this over-self, this dedicated to truth part of our lives. If this dedication unfolds, develops, and strengthens within us, then as the various conditions of life arise, we apply it uh, to these conditions and find it solutional to each in its own time and place. So we can liken this radiant inner self to the very principle of light. Light which shining uh, from various sources upon the innumerable forms of living things conveys to each according to its needs so that one sun supports all the infinite diversity of nature as we see it around us and experience it within us. And the same light that adds to the plumage of the bird also brings color to the flower. And the same light or power which gives energy to the bird for its song gives energy for man when he wishes to make great creative contribution to life. So everywhere, this one energy is capable of being dis diffused according to its own needs and according to the needs of the creature which receives this energy. In man, consequently, once the Samboda principle, the principle of the luminous enlightened self, is established within, in that, in, as soon as that is achieved, the individual can apply this light to whatever emergency arises. If there is a d danger of st uh, strife arising, this light will bring peace. If there is fear, this light will bring faith. If there is anger, this light will bring peace and uh, security to the individual. Whatever department of life there is, uh, light, if it is stronger than circumstance, dissipates that which is not good, permitting only the luminous and the happy and the peaceful to remain. In this way, as we grow in insight and grow in enlightenment, we also gain by degrees the power to control those pressures within ourselves which may in the course of time lead to sickness unless they are controlled. The Akshibhuta uh, Buddha, therefore, stands for preventive medicine. The prevention of sickness by the removal of the cause of sickness. Now the cause of sickness in Eastern philosophy is karmic. Now in also in this concept it may not be possible for the individual due to the in inflexible principle of karma to be successful in every case in uh, mitigating uh, the situations that have already been established by karma. The individual who has dissipated for many years may not be able in a short time to overcome the consequences of this dissipation. But one thing is certain, if light begins to arise within him, he will improve his condition, and he will also no longer set up causes for further destructive effects to occur within himself. Therefore, enlightenment helps us to bear the burden of debt that must be paid, but also prevents us from incurring new debt of a similar nature. And as the uh, old debts are paid and no new debts are made, 
the individual finds his life gradually unfolding into a peaceful and constructive experience. These things are part of the ancient belief in these areas, and uh, they have uh, had long validity in human expression, not only in the Eastern nations, but all over the world, where the individual has used his religion as a means of improving his physical adjustments with life. Now the uh, imagery of the Aksha Buddha also conveys the uh, symbolism of worship. And while it is not true, and uh, I notice that the latest edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica has finally become a little more enlightened. There is a trace of a Samboda overtone in their most recent article on Buddhism. The Encyclopedia states uh, simply that enlightened Buddhists do not worship images. This is a tremendous discovery for the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> this, uh, however, bears in mind certain factors we have to consider. Uh, one is that the individual seeking help nearly always has to make a symbolic gesture of some kind. When we have physical difficulties, we go to the doctor. And when the Buddhist has his physical or psychic difficulties, he may go to a physician, he, very likely he will, but he will also go to the temple because he is particularly <coughs> concerned with being spiritually in order. And this is something we have completely neglected for the, uh, in uh, Western medical thinking. We, uh, the Western doctor, if he is thoughtful, does recognize the religious equation. He realizes that for some reason he is more successful where the patient has greater internal insight. But it has never been formalized into a real basic concept. But just as surely as in Asiatic nations a man may have more than one religion, so in Asiatic nations a man may have more than one approach to his own health problem. Uh, he might have a half a dozen different points of view as to things that might help. And being an Easterner, and not being under the tremendous scientific psychology of the West, he does all the things that he thinks might help, and undoubtedly at least gains a better mental attitude as the result of such complete cooperation. In any event, though he has a physician, he may go to the temple, and there he may make his offering, either in worship or in worldly goods, to the symbol of the healing power. He makes his offering not because he is worshiping an image, but because within himself he is seeking the re-establishment of harmony. He is seeking that which will help the physician to help him physically. He is seeking to elevate his consciousness above doubt. He is seeking to face whatever the physical problem may be with the deepest possible insight and the greatest and most enduring faith. He looks into the f mysterious reposed expression of this healing deity. He senses the tranquility and peace of the sacred place. He is in a quiet relationship with immovable principles. So he gradually comes to a certain internal adjustment. After all, he is an instrument of law. He is not concerned with some of the problems that most heavily disturb us. To him, his universe is so great and the conditions of life extending into the infinite future, these conditions are so numerous and varied that he is not bound to the terrible desperation of an individual who must continue to live here or all is lost. He has a restatement within himself, a bringing forth from the subconscious into the conscious of all the symbolism for which this peaceful, reposed image uh, conveys. First of all, he experiences in this image acceptance. This quiet, peaceful image tells him uh, that it is up to him to accept. 
that whatever the outcome of the problem is to be, it is a lawful problem. It is a rightful problem. It is something through which the human being must quietly move. And whether he recovers or does not recover, the law still works. This great eternal peace still envelops him. He will have his moments of anxiety, but these will be within a vast area of complete acceptances. So he seeks for the peaceful adjustment of his life with the symbol of peace as he understands it. And he tries to take the same attitude of, as the mystic Christian takes, of suffering things to be so now, because they too shall pass away. Whatever condition arises is experience, is opportunity, is lesson, is part of the great unfolding mystery of the law. Against this mystery there is no opposition possible. The individual must accept, must adjust, and must build his life into the natural accordances of this lawful procedure. If, therefore, in his meditation he discovers some failing in himself, some situation in which he has not kept the rules, he makes a new resolution to do his best, to be quiet, to be gentle, uh, not to permit any tension or stress, to injure the remedies which the physician may be able to give him. So he sort of brings his life back into the focus of his great religious philosophical convictions. He experiences also the conviction that as this mood arises within him, his own luminosity increases in this Samboda principle. And after his anxieties have become quiet and he has his total acceptances again, he feels the working of the law through himself. He feels that he has become again receptive to the great healing mystery of life that in his quietude he is like the mendicant with his begging bowl. He is holding out the empty bowl to the light of eternal life. He is acknowledging that all that he is and all that he has depends upon law and upon his own ability to live in harmony with it, to love it, to understand it, to serve it. And that if this relationship is right, then everything will be right for him, regardless of whether it is just what he wants or not. He has learned to place his own desires set second uh, to the immutable, unchangeable pattern that is represented by the eternally peaceful image toward which he makes his offering. So having made peace with the symbol of health, having accepted in substance the great law of health, its spiritual meaning, its esoteric significance, its metaphysical implications. He goes back and does the things which his physician requires with a further confidence, because in those old days his physician might be beside him in the temple, also asking insight. In this case, perhaps for the moment, the physician is not asking help for himself. He is asking that this same symbol of the great light of truth uh, shall confer upon him the insight necessary to help another person. That actually there is only one source of health as there is one source of life, and that is the ever-flowing fountain of universal realities. And he is a servant of this, and he asks that he may be a good and faithful servant. And because the patient knows that his physician is a devout man, and because the physician knows that his patient is a devout person, these two have a certain mingling of consciousness also. Uh, what one does does not outrage the other. There is no conflict. It is quite possible that the physician is as much of a priest as the uh, monk or abbot of the shrine which has been visited. All these things uh, are fitted together into a strange pattern of understanding, sympathy, and mutual respect. And we cannot deny that at least in theory such a relationship is the ideal one between the doctor and the patient. 
that both shall in common understanding and insight bow to the same principles, accept the same realities, and serve the same truths, each on his own level. Now in many areas in rural Asia, uh, there are no physicians as we know them. Uh, the temple has to carry on all of the labors of healing. We know this was also true in ancient times in Europe and in the Near East, and is still true in many of the primitive peoples of the world. These peoples are, are perfectly willing and ready today to accept the new ways that we would bring them, and we have certainly done a great deal to improve their healths. We have given them lesson after lesson in sanitation and hygiene, eugenics, and things of these kind, which are very essential to these peoples. But we can also, in bringing them health, we can destroy them utterly. We can destroy them if we remove from them their sense of veneration and respect for life itself. If in the course of educating them we take them away from their principles and leave them only our science, we will bring them very little permanent good. They have not the wisdom or insight to realize the tremendous health problem we are struggling with. Uh, to them we are gods, bringing them a skill and a wonder that is beyond anything they have experienced before. But right in the wake of these gods come the merchants and the industrialists. Right behind the physician comes the entire pattern of Western ways. And after he has had three or four inoculations and has had two or three lessons in sanitation, then comes the radio, the television, the motion picture, and the most magnificent postgraduate course in delinquency that the West can possibly bestow on him. <laughs> So that uh, instead of science moving into his life as a great saving principle, it is too often only a wedge to impose upon him our total problem. And our total problem is one we have not solved. Therefore, why should we present it to him? Why should we take away from him a faith that has given him courage for ages and substitute only for it a few hypodermics, a few vials, and a handful of pills? We cannot do too much for him this way. We may lengthen his life, but he may, as the result of this lengthened life, live to see his tribes in revolution, to see his religion fall apart, uh, to see him step by step swallowed up into some power pressure pattern which he wants no part of, but which sweeps in upon him with all the pressures of what we call the modern way of life. If he accepts all these pressures, he will then develop new ailments for which there are no pills, and he will be right back where he was. He will have his death rate restored, but the ailments will be different. If he uh, once died because of physical filth, he may now die because of moral filth. There is no way in which we can be sure that an unenlightened uh, point of view can bestow security upon anyone else. And this we all begin to realize right here, as we see that education, science, and progress are not preventing the mental breakdown, they are not from prevent, uh, preventing the increase of crime, and they are not preventing juvenile delinquency. None of these things have been touched. So we may find it rather profitable uh, to realize what we have also sometimes affirmed, and now is open to debate, whether or not delinquency is also a form of sickness. I think that uh, Buddhism would say that delinquency is a form of sickness and that this form of sickness arises in the inability of the individual uh, to organize or integrate his internal resources. The individual who does not have on the inside something better than is on the outside is always going to be victim of the outside. If he has no character within, he cannot steer a course that will bring him anywhere except perhaps into a recurrent difficulty. To meet this problem, the concept of the Yakshi Buddha then simply is that of healing due 
to the creation of the over-self, the creation of an increasingly wise, beautiful, and noble person within that body. That this symbol, therefore, represents enlightenment as the universal doctor, the universal physician, the universal remedy. There is something almost to the magic of alchemy in this concept. It comes down to us from the same idea that the ancients had, that somewhere there was a medicine, a universal remedy for the sickness of the world. And the alchemists sought for it in many ways, and the wisest of them pointed out uh, that the actual remedy, the great medicine, was the comforter, was the gift of the spirit. That actually when the inner life of man becomes strong, this inner life disciplines him away from many things that cause sickness. And this inner life constantly guards and guides the normal functions of the body. Every destructive attitude injures the body. Every constructive attitude contributes to the normal function of body. If the body is battered constantly by the inner pressures, this body will be sick. If, however, this body basks in the light of a great internal insight, so that it is guarded and properly cared for, uh, not uh, by the individual becoming uh, completely absorbed in taking care of his body, sometimes the body operates best when we think least about it, but if our basic thinking is right, if our thinking on life is correct, this normalcy, this correctness, will inevitably manifest through our physical conduct. And as it affects our physical ways of life, it affects the sickness probabilities which we are forced to consider. There is no way in which any philosophy of life can bestow safety upon an unsafe generation. Obsessed as we are by speed, uh, burdened by the traffic of freeways, constantly endangered by the pollution of our air and the corruption of water, and also the alteration of foods and things of this nature, it is very difficult for us to live completely normal, healthy lives. So there is another question that I think uh, Asia has asked and to which Asia has strangely found some answers, perhaps not dogmatic answers, but certainly they are as good as ours. Just as the air in which we breathe and the very atmosphere which surrounds our planet has the power to absorb into it a reasonable amount of impurity, transform this impurity absorb it, purify itself again, and be prepared for further use by mankind, as the ocean can receive into itself a vast amount of the impurities of the land. It will purify this uh, impurity within natural reason and will restore the mysterious balance of nature a balance in which what we cannot use is useful to something else. And what we can use, we take. And if we live a reasonably natural existence, uh, nature is able to carry a certain amount of inevitable difficulty. Uh, to the Buddhist, the same thing is true in relation to this Samboda principle. Uh, if the individual has this principle reasonably strong within his own consciousness, it is capable of neutralizing a great deal of pressure coming from the outside. It can neutralize almost any situation that is not caused by the individual himself. It is not going to be able to neutralize an overdose of alcohol. It is not going to be able to neutralize too many antibiotics, because these are forced upon it. But the individual who lives in a world, the tempo of which is too rapid, the individual who has to live to a measure uh, in an unnatural way, an individual whose, whose requirements perhaps have been made somewhat unreasonable by the conditions of his living, uh, nature can and will carry a considerable load of this problem. 
And nature can, particularly through this inner life of man, maintain a continual purifying of circumstances over which the individual has no control. That which is not his, which is not uh, under his direct control, may therefore be neutralized by a, a continuous maintenance of inner tranquility. If the person is unmoved by certain situations about which he has no direct concern, then he will help to maintain his health and maintain his peace of mind. So that it is true beyond any reasonable doubt that this inner enlightenment, this inner security, this inner uh, strength can compensate for a great many external situations for which the less integrated person has no defenses whatsoever. In the Samboda nature, consequently, the individual is building uh, this uh, nature which the Chinese call the transcendent being. It is this over-self which is the true self. The true self which is not uh, the result of our objective procedures alone, but is constantly built out of our understanding or reflection or consideration of experience. To Buddhism, all of the transcendent nature is the result of man's correct interpretation of experience. The individual learns to grow, to be more, to achieve more within himself by a constant attendance uh, to the values of things he can learn, study, consider, analyze, and observe in world affairs around him. Thus, as we are able to make a truly, consciously correct adjustment to things that happen, uh, we gain greater and deeper insight in ourselves. In the uh, theory of uh, Buddhist healing also, uh, we have the development in Shingong particularly of a series of, ma of great mandala concepts. Uh, to the Eastern mind, anything that is tangible, anything other than the infinite itself, can be in some way expressed. And this expression in turn, moving in upon the individual, gives him some kind of a further source of personal growth or support. Therefore, in most Eastern sim systems, there are symbolic patterns that represent normalcy symbolic patterns which represent the proper internal attitude of the individual. Naturally, these patterns are diagrams. Uh, they are not uh, pictures, really, but they are symbolic pressures from the outside which are accepted into consciousness. And when they are so accepted, they become factors of consciousness. We are reminded in this particular point of the essay of Plotinus on the beautiful, one of the great Neoplatonic thinkers. Uh, in his effort to understand or e express uh, what the power of beauty is and why beauty affects us, Plotinus said uh, that the human soul is a magnificently ordered, symmetrical, balanced thing of incredible beauty of itself, perhaps resembling some mysterious and magnificent geometric form like a snowflake. It is something which is supernally magnificent. This beauty in man, beholding beauty around it, the soul looking out through the eyes into the world, uh, rejoices when it discovers around it things like itself. Therefore, when symmetry within man beholds symmetry around him, it is comforted. It experiences a great sense of peace 
or joy. And if this symmetry around the individual, if these patterns of beauty which surround him are strong enough, as in the case of great works of art or great music, or magnificent expressions in poetry or literature, Plotinus felt that this soul, which is always a lover of the beautiful, rushes out from within the individual in joy to embrace its likeness in other things. So that actually the soul is stirred within the individual by beholding things like itself, things which remind it of itself, uh, things which are compatible to its own nature. And consequently, there is a rapport between the good in man and the good in the world. As the good in man increases, it becomes more capable of determining what is good in the world. And when the good in the world increases, the soul of man expresses itself more completely and more abundantly in the continuous operations of life. This, I think, is almost identically the Buddhist position, and it is now believed that, in all probabilities, Buddhism reached Alexandria uh, before the time of the Neoplatonists and possibly affected their doctrine and that also of the Gnostics. In any event, our principle uh, is that in Buddhist art, the mandala, the image, the sacred picture, is an effort to express the principles of the doctrine the effort to express certain qualities which man inwardly perceiving these qualities is moved to a rejoicing, is, remo is moved to an accepting. Just as the peace of the quiet image in meditation uh, calls forth a rejoicing, a sense of peace within the individual, he feels more right when he is in the presence of peace than when he is in the presence of discord. He feels stronger and better in the presence of beauty than he does in the presence of things that are asymmetrical or deformed. Therefore, naturally, as Pythagoras also tells us, there is a therapy through the eyes. Man perceiving things uh, which are of their own nature symbolic of eternal principles. Man's realization of these internal and eternal principles may be stimulated within himself. If we think this is strange, let us remember that it is no stranger than in the problem of words. For we cannot say that the letters of words, by their shapes or their sounds, actually contain within them the overtones that we receive when we hear them. Therefore, as noble words uh, convey certain insight and certain understanding, uh, we realize that this understanding arises in us, not in the word itself. In the same way in religious art, music, poetry, it is not the wording, it is not the picture that is conveyed inward. It is that something within ourselves arises, awakens, or moves toward the acceptance of that which our own consciousness in its archetypal form recognizes to be good. This is the exact opposite of our common idea that the psychologically troubled person uh, should express from within himself his deformities. In the East, it is rather that the individual who is disturbed shall become quiet and accept into himself the medicinal power of beauty, of order, of the recognition of values. And if he is able to achieve this, that which is not valuable will fall away in his own experience. He will no longer have these pressures which must have various distorted expressions. He will rather be able to accept these magnificent and harmonic patterns and will be improved or helped or treated successfully by being presented to the, by, uh, presented to the symbols of the doctrines which are most sacred to him. So in these uh, forms also, 
there is the therapy of the individuals perceiving in some artistic manner the vastness, the beauty, the dignity, the perfection of the concept. And one of the principles that we find in nearly all the mandala forms that were used in the temples is that they are symmetrical. Artists say they are too mechanical, that there is not enough spontaneity in them, that they represent an endless copying of the same idea, that they are not great works of art, even though they may be great ministers to man's need. Uh, this is a matter of controversy. Certainly, I think they are more valuable to us than the undisciplined art with which we are surrounded today. Perhaps some of these older pictures are too disciplined for our liking, but they are intended for one purpose, and that is to remind us that until we accept the discipline of truth and the discipline of beauty, we can never be happy and we can never be healthy. So whether we like these things or not, they are constant reminders that law rules, that life is a lawful procedure, and that in most instances sickness is in some way a breaking of law or a failure to recognize the lawful procedure under a certain situation. The uh, symmetrical images themselves for the most part, they are very skillfully balanced in design. Nearly all convey a sense of great repose. They are not uh, designed as our art is primarily to please. They are designed primarily to be experienced as a value in life. They seek to break through into the patterns of integrities. If, therefore, a very humble person with very little uh, intellectual development in these areas uh, should, in a Buddhist country, approach the Akish Buddha for help in case of sickness, uh, they will come to this image with a great sense of faith, a sense that they are coming into the presence of the symbol of a principle, that some way this symbol signifies the absolute strength and certainty of the universal plan, that in the presence of this image all doubts concerning providence are removed. The individual suddenly accepts in the symbolism of his religion the fact that there is an eternal rightness that he is part of this rightness, and that if he accepts this rightness without question, an alchemy is performed within himself. We are all aware that uh, in religious healing, in modern shrines such as those at Lourdes in France or saint anne de beaupre in Canada, that there have been miraculous records that the ailments which have defied every known remedy have suddenly, mysteriously, at least temporarily, been cured. That these changes can be due only to a great psychic change must inevitably be accepted. Therefore, it is known beyond doubt in human religious experience that the individual who comes into a completely integrated relationship with his faith has a strength and has a power that is denied the doubter and the scoffer, that he has a source of value which cannot come to the person of nominal religious affiliation. It cannot come simply because we belong to something. It can only come when we put our full confidence and our complete faith in the inevitability of the good we believe. It has to be the individual abdicating his own doubts and accepting instead the inevitable workings of the truths which he holds to be sacred. This situation undoubtedly was the beginning and basis of psychotherapy. 
It was also the oldest form of healing that the world developed, a form based completely upon the power of the individual uh, to have sufficient faith uh, to change the functions of the body. We have evidence of this. We know that it still does occur. We know that it is comparatively rare, but we also realize that great faith is comparatively rare in these times. Measures of faith we have. Great faith we do not have. Now, great faith can arise from one of several different causes. One cause, of course, is the complete acceptance of a religious belief. That this belief, regardless of whether we rationalize it or not, if it is totally and completely accepted, if we associate ourselves with its principles without doubt or any form of uh, uncertainty, this faith can become a tremendous force. The direction of the faith perhaps is not so important to us as the intensity of it, the reality of it, the individual making a final adjustment with faith. Now, a final adjustment with any religion today in our world is one kind of adjustment and one adjustment only. That is the individual achieving through acceptance. There are no cases that we know of of a major religion in which adjustment places the individual in a position superior to his faith. In other words, uh, we do not have this kind of a reaction in an individual who considers himself equal to or superior to the universe in which he lives. It is always based upon some form of acceptance. The individual shifting something of self-will and accepting more and more of the inevitable of divine will. Another way of expressing it is that the individual surrenders part of his personal way of life to a, to a power superior to himself. If he does not recognize anything in the universe superior to his own ego, he cannot benefit in any way from what we might term uh, the uh, psychotherapy of religion. He has to be humble. He has to relax. He has to return the uh, guardianship and guidance of the world to those powers which fashioned it. He has to have what we might term an accepting mind and heart. And this is true both in the West and in the East. The great strength of the Buddhist philosophy in Asia has been that it has brought individuals to a realization that they do not have to run the universe. They do not have to take over the vast administration of space. The world is not simply an, an, an area waiting to be conquered by science. The, uh, the universe is not something that has to be dominated and controlled by man. And the great purpose of man is not to continue this mysterious process of trying to plant his flag on some remote sphere. This is not the purpose for life. Man is not here merely to consider a space, an area, waiting for him to conquer it. Actually, man is here uh, only a short time out of the vast infinitudes of existence. He is here to unfold himself and to come to the only final contact with space which he is capable of achieving, and that is the contact of inner sympathy. The only way we will ever know the universe in which we exist is when our love and respect for that universe uh, become the guiding instruments of discovery. We can never really conquer space, but we can experience it. We can find it as a magnificent experience within ourselves. 
We think we can conquer space, certainly we can send spaceships from one planet to another and perhaps someday go way out beyond the solar system and then we think we have conquered space. But we haven't at all, any more than the ship has conquered the ocean, simply because it sails on it. The realities of the matter remain as they have always been. Nothing uh, is changed, essentially, by man. Man only uses or abuses that which already is. In healing and health, therefore, man reaches out to discover something. And I think Buddhism feels that it can affirm that this discovery is reasonable. Namely, that this same space which sustains all life has in its very substance and essence this medicine which is for the healing of the nations. Space itself is healthy. Space desires to produce and sustain healthy things. It is the purpose of space to bring forth lives that are lawful, that live lawfully, unfold their potentials. It is the duty of existence that it shall be forever fruitful, not only fruitful of man, but of all conceivable life and energy. Therefore, the human being can sometime come into harmonic relationship with the universal life pattern to which he belongs. He can come to know life, he can come to experience life, he can come to share in life. And as these uh, growths are achieved within himself, he will find that in these attainments he will come to the great art of healing, to the great science of medicine. For medicine actually is man's effort to cooperate with nature, not to dominate it. And when man tries to force nature with remedy, nature rebels. And this is one of the problems we face in the highly developed uh, uh, chemical medicine that we have today. We are not supposed to cure men. We are supposed to give nature help to reestablish normalcy. We are to provide nature with better instruments to fulfill its own works. And only to the degree, therefore, that we listen to nature, that we are observant of nature, that we find out what nature wants and provide it, only in these ways do we achieve. When we decide what nature needs and we provide it, only because of our own opinion on the matter we are likely to lose our patience very quickly. In the Yakushi's concept, therefore, the individual shares a whole group of moods. He, he sees the representation to him of what might be termed the perfected person. He sees the image itself as symbolizing the great peace, the great integration, the great quietude, the perfect balance the perfect relaxation, the, the marvelous deep internal semi-detachment that to these people signifies the noblest condition of human consciousness. He sees, therefore, that in a great peace which can come within himself just as surely as it permeates this work of art, here is part of the medicine to be at peace with all that lives is to have a strange healing within ourselves. And then the doctrine itself represented further by the image, the doctrine of quiet uh, relaxation, the, the doctrine of man giving up joyously that which is wrong in order that he may with greater joy embrace that which is right. The individual who has achieved a quiet discipline over his own faculties, living in a continuing mindfulness of that which is true and that which is proper. The image suggests all these things. It is not simply a fetish or a charm or a talisman. It is a continual instruction, always in a mysterious way conveying to the worshiper the fact that he must be like 
the qualities which the image itself personifies, that he must find in this his greater good, and that as he builds this transcendent being within his own nature, the healing power, the, the Buddha of health, is one of the mysterious attributes of the Buddhic consciousness within his own nature. When he, is, uh, when he is sad and weary of the world, one of these Buddhic powers takes form and comforts him. Uh, when he is in need of great consolation, there arises in this light within himself the gracious form of the deity Kondon. Uh, when he needs to have insight, when his wisdom must be sharpened, when he must take the law and apply it to the great problems of intellectual existence, then there appears riding upon its eternal lion, the Bodhisattva Manjusri, Lord of true wisdom. For within light is also the power to truly understand and the tremendous victory of wisdom. And when this same thinker goes home at the end of a business day and he finds himself again with his loved ones and his children and he is quiet in the Buddhist concept of things, then within him rises the Jizo, the deity of little children, the power to love and to play and to think, all the quiet thoughts of gentility in life. Here comes the time of peace and rest and friendship, the infinite patience with the foibles of the young. Once the consciousness is so integrated, the individual calls upon the various colors that are concealed within the white light, and these colors come forth as they are needed, for these are what Bacon calls the colors of good and evil. And so whatever may be the problem or the difficulty, the individual who has achieved this consciousness within himself, this consciousness takes on or takes over the attributes and attitudes of something, becoming formalized as a direct solution to a direct problem. When the problem is passed, then this direct solution returns again to its own strange depths to be called forth whenever needed. Therefore, the luminous Samboda body can be called upon, and out of it will come whatever is necessary to that moment. For this light, which is the light of true wisdom, true uh, faith, true love, and true acceptance of law, this light contains within itself the particular solution to all problems. And when in the hour of pain or sickness the individual calls upon light as the great physician to come and give him the true insight, the true understanding, the true wisdom, and the true patience, then out of the light comes the shadowy form of the Yaksha Buddha. Because it is only one of the attributes of truth, or whatever the problem, within the light of truth is the solution. And the individual who has built this luminous self behind will never be left desolated by the problems of the physical existence through which he is passing. Well, time is up, so thank you very much. <laughs> now I have several other interesting announcements uh, which I think you will probably all want to hear. So uh, I think we'd better tell you that recently a few days ago, to be in fact, we got in a very large group of books. Uh, these books uh, uh, represent a library of very diversified interests. And I want to tell you right at the beginning, I haven't read them all, and I do not expect to. There are books on almost every subject you can think of, from cookbooks to expert navigation on the canals of France. You will find books on hobbies, on art, you will find fiction, you will find many different things. And as they are intended uh, primarily to advance the funds of the society, we have marked them very low and anyone who is interested should browse, because whatever you're interested in, you might find it. There's just a little bit of everything. 
There are also a number of books in our own specialized field and those you might also want to look over. There are many interesting and unusual books on music, on art, on almost all the areas of uh, diversified interests. So we hope you will look around here today and uh, uh, give them your very careful consideration. Uh, the, uh, there will be more next week and more the week after and more the week after that, so don't be discouraged if you don't happen to find it today. Also, I'd like to call to your attention that the PRS study group meets this afternoon after the lecture, and I have a feeling that uh, this morning's lecture should produce some other interesting discussion there. Uh, the study group, uh, headquarters study group, invites anyone who is interested uh, to attend this afternoon directly after the present uh, meeting uh, there is, as a guest of this study group, and we hope as many of you will attend as possible. Dr. Bode will deliver a lecture here on Tuesday on, the Chine on Chinese yoga as expressed and revealed through the very remarkable book, The Secret of the Golden Flower, a discipline of experiencing Tao in a superconditioned state. I think you'll find this rather an interesting talk. I'd like to also call attention to the fact that next week we have the uh, lecture for the mystery lover, ghost lore of the East and West, the old question that has concerned the world for ages. Do troubled spirits return to haunt the living? And if they do, are they any worse than some of the hauntings we do to ourselves? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the problem of ghost lore, however, I think is a very interesting one. It touches deeply into human psychology. It relates to a great many areas which uh, most persons uh, have been involved in to some degree. So I think you'll find it an interesting subject. I might point out that our display of the Otsu folk art is on in the library. The end case in the library are five very fine Otsu original paintings, which I think you'll be interested to see. These have a great deal of navite in them. They are delightful. And the large central painting there is a religious picture of the earliest Otsu type and is a very valuable work of art. So we hope you'll be interested in that. We have two booklets on the table, Kabbalistic, prayer, uh, uh, Kabbalistic Keys to the Lord's Prayer and Basic Principles of Domestic Psychology. These have been put out in booklet form because of numerous requests. We also have uh, a lecture note on mental management. So we hope that you will consider all of these possibilities. There are a good many things to see today. In the gift shop there are new things, in the library there are interesting pictures, and there is the beginning of this deluge of books, and we hope that you will all find something that is interesting to you, and I think you will find that they are priced very reasonably, more cheaper than you could ever hope to buy them elsewhere. Thank you very much for being with us this morning.